Please welcome the very lovely Cara Cooney, everybody. Cara Cooney. <laughs> Cara, welcome, welcome. How lovely to see you. You look lovely in your thank red you. dress. Thank yeah. you, thank you. Yeah, some of the gentlemen in the audience are barking. <laughs> They're barking in a rather sophisticated fashion at you. Well, I have my, I have my archaeology look, the, the khakis, the shirt, yeah. and then I have my talk show look. You, you should uh, do a bit of archaeology in that stuff. That yeah, would, uh, I think it's practical. It doesn't yeah. work quite so well. well I don't know. Bending over with a little trowel it would work for me. You know what, I'm not going to touch that. think you found something. <laughs> I'm not If I showed up in this in Egypt, in the middle yeah. of Cairo, no, anywhere, maybe not it would Egypt. be really, yeah. really, really bad. Yeah, and no, I'm no. already a circus freak in that town. Why, why are you a circus freak in Cairo? Why? Well, it, I'm six foot tall. So yes, you are I walk six down the street and seriously, blocks of people stop and look at me and go, oh my God, children cry. Look at the yeah. tall lady. And um, well, I, have, I have one good story. So I'm, Cairo is... A safe place. I'm safer there than Los Angeles, New York at four in the morning. I feel very safe, but it's a very in-your-face place. Right. So people are always uh, talking, yelling, come to my perfume shop, do you want to see the pyramids, blah, blah, blah. Well, hey, that, lady, that happens hey, out lady. there in L.A. You'll yeah. hear that any night of the week so, out there. One day, and this is towards the end of six months in Egypt, and I was very like, don't make eye contact with men, just keep walking, keep walking. Mm. And so I'm walking along, and... This big man in a galabea, which is like a long flowing Egyptian robe, I can see he's going to block my path. He's going to make trouble. Mm. And I think to myself, oh, just keep walking, keep walking. And this big man stops in the middle of the, the sidewalk and says, Welcome, tall woman. And the whole street laughed. Everybody cracked up. I cracked up. And the freak show went on. And it was all good. So, I, should, I should have done that when you come out, when I introduced welcome, you. I should have done, tall welcome, tall woman. Come, sit. Now, what have you you've been doing out in it? I first met you at the... Uh, at we met at King Tut in 2005. Right, the King yeah. Tut thing. Yeah, we the, go back way, way oh, back. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, not as far back as the stuff you're usually working with. No, but, the but dead far people, back. no, not that Have far. you ever been looking on a, on a hieroglyph in a pyramid and seen something, that, anything that looks like Bob Barker at all? No. <laughs> There is a hieroglyph for a little old guy. Well, no, that, that thing, ain't him. So. No, if you're looking for a... Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, no. Now, what have you been doing out there in Egypt, then? What is this lost queen of Egypt? Uh, lost queen of Egypt, Hatshepsut. Can you say it? Ha Hatshepsut? Yeah, that's good. Ha Hatshepsut. Yeah, because most people can't pronounce it. They say Hatshepsut. I say Hatshepsut. They stumble over it. That, that works, too. Hatshepsut. Good, but you have to go with the hat. Yeah. You, you hat practice. She put. You, you actually practice. How will I remember this? That's yeah, smart. Yeah. Hatshepsut was a queen of Egypt. Right. And actually, at the death of her husband, and then seven years later on, she took on the kingship. So she actually claimed to be a man, wore, well, Why did she claim to be a man? wore a false beard. She went topless and claimed to be a man? Who does she think she is? Jack Nicholson? <laughs> I don't get that at all. <laughs> it's a callback to a joke we did another night. Go I, uh, Hillary, I didn't get that. Well, see, Jack Nicholson was on the beach recently and he took his top off and he's got lady breasts, oh, really. He's got man breasts. Yeah, man breasts, yeah. Well, lady breasts would be a different thing. Yeah. They found the mummy and the mummy's got the mummies? breasts. The mummies? So if she did go topless, even in sacred priestly processions, she, she had it going on. So they, she said, I'm a man, I just happen to have breasts, don't worry about it, I'm the queen. King. King. She couldn't use the she couldn't use the word queen because queen is just the wife of the king. So it doesn't really mean anything. So she right. had to take on the masculine gender. She and she had to be very ambivalent about it because she was still a woman. Everyone knew it. Right. And she had the full support of the priesthood. She had the full support of the elites. You can't make this kind of a shift without that support. Yeah, and, and a bit of surgery, to be honest. <laughs> um, which she didn't go that far. No, right. Uh, okay. You know, just did the dressing and all of that. All right. And, you yes. know, the depiction. Move on. Move on. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and the cool thing about Hatshepsut is that. Everyone calls her the scheming queen and the queen who tried to take power away from the rightful heir who was Tutmos III. And really, she's the one that laid the groundwork for this guy's empire. She's the one that laid the groundwork to make sure that he had succession of the throne without any sort of contest. And he was able, he, they call him the Napoleon of Egypt. Who so, was the Napoleon? Tutmos? Tutmos III. Tutmos and III. this is the guy that she ruled with. He was her co-king. So she didn't push him out completely. She ruled with him, but she was much older than him. Right. And, and then she gave him the reins of the, of the army. So if he wanted to take her out, he could have. What, just take, didn't. What, take her As out, in like, kill her, oh, assassinate, kill her, yeah, yeah. take her out. Uh, I thought yeah. you meant, you know, you know, take her out. let's go to Hooters or something. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hey, what, now, 
why? I mean, you're an Egyptologist, right? I am, that's your, I that's am, your I am job. An Egyptologist. You're an Egyptologist. Yes. What? How many Egyptologists are there in, in America? Do you have a union? No, we should. You we should have, have a, a union. union, yeah. Um, in America, 500, maybe. Yeah, is, is, it, is, it, a, you know, is it a tight-knit community? Is there a lot it of is. backbiting and scheming? And There's not a lot of backbiting and scheming, but we do get together at yearly conferences and drink a lot. I see. Lots of gin and tonic. This is where you I learned to drink whiskey straight up on a dig. Stuff. So, we do, yeah. yeah. How and, dare you um, say that about Hatchie Do you know how much I'm going to get? <laughs> Just this Discovery Channel show, do you know how much hell I'm going to get from my colleagues for this? What? Because there's a part where I say, I would love to believe that she was trained to be king. And then they cut me right, right. before I said, but of course that would never happen. Right. So they're going to see this, and they're all going to write me emails and say, Kara, how could you say such a horrible thing? And, and I'm going to get all of this. It's show business, bitch. Get used exactly. to it. Tell them that. Exactly. Tell and them that. They cut me when they cut me, and that's who they cut that's me. That's the way it so, happens. Yeah. Kara, I could talk to you about Egypt for, oh, years. Um, you love talking about dead people. Well, you know what it is? I don't know if it's just Egypt, or it might just be you. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure it's Egypt at all, but it's always lovely to see you. Kara Kuna, everybody. We'll be right back with Jeff Keith. Please welcome Cara Cooney, everybody. Dr. Cara Cooney. Hello, Cara. How you doing? Okay, okay, okay. What? I feel like you're stalking me. I'm not stalking this you. This is talk show stalking. No, 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 the no. The whole monologue, the book, the, the hat. Yeah. The, I was just trying to make you feel comfortable, that's all, because I knew you're an creepy. Egyptologist. I thought if I threw in a few things about Egypt, maybe you would calm down. <laughs> Clearly I was wrong. Fine. Right. Do you ever go uphill skiing with Tim Daly? Yeah. What about that? <laughs> no, I, I can't I, believe you just showed this that, on I know, this national is, this television. Is, that's, it's how, this is a very expensive book, though, isn't it? Yeah, it's like $120, because it sells in euros. It's Leiden University. You keep talking about Amsterdam, right? Right, yeah. It's right next door. So you go to Schiphol. What? Schiphol. The, the, it's the, the airport right next to Amsterdam. Oh. So you fly into Schiphol. Instead of going to Amsterdam, you go the other direction, you go to Leiden. That's where this book was born. So it's 80 euros. But if you transfer that into dollars, it's like 120, 140 dollars. You can't get it on Amazon. There's not, there's not even so you can show it, it. But they can't buy it. And they only, you know, it's for institutions, it's for academics. academics. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, they can try well, to buy it. But um, it, well, they, there's they not that they, many. Look, I'm, I don't want to hurt your feelings. They don't want to buy it. I know. It's. <laughs> It's, I, and I'll tell you what, it's too ahead of them. It's too ahead of them because this is, this is your expert's book on ancient yeah, Egypt. Yeah, what, yeah. I, what I want to do is get a brief overview of ancient Egypt uh, for the folks here who are clearly fascinated by the right whole here, thing. Right I mean, when, seven I, minute well, when overview. I, I put that, yeah. Um, that's such a hard question. Where do I start? I mean, we're well, 3,000 years of history. 3,000 years of history. So you start around 3000 BCE and then it all falls apart with the Mark Antony Cleopatra debacle. So oh, really? then they become part of the Roman province and that's 30 BCE and then it's a disaster after that. But I mean the thing about Egypt that's the most extraordinary is that you've got continuity the whole way through. And 3000 years unchanged? It's not unchanged but the religion's the same, the language is the same. It, it changes through time just like English, you know, you listen to Shakespeare in English it sounds different yes. than English now. Right. So ancient Egyptian, you know, if they heard a bunch of Middle Egyptian and they were speaking late Egyptian they'd be like what the hell is that? It's right. really They're, weird. So it would be a little bit different, but the Egyptian language, hieroglyphic the language script, I mean like? it's it nobody knows. Right. Because it's the ancient Egyptians didn't have vowels in the in the way that they well, wrote. Well, they would go say so, but they, would they say they the things like would they the say vowels. owl eye sideways head? You know, like like they're writing. Like if you know, you know, the writing's all like the sideways owl, head. Uh, the owl, go, is owl eye sideways head, cat dog man. You know, the owl is an M. It's it's an the M. The owl's an M. It's an M. I like the it was letter an M. M. There's no, it, that's the quail chick. The quail chick is an ooh. Well, You've been they, trying to study hieroglyphs on your own. Why didn't you call me? Well, what? I, what I wanted doing? to impress you with my knowledge oh of hieroglyphics. God. The quail chick is an M. Well, I thought, the, I thought the owl was an ooh because owls go ooh. No. And I thought that's why they had an owl. The owl is an M. It's a preposition for M, but it's also just a letter. So it's a, it's a collection of, of signs. Some of them are phonetic, right? right? So M, P, B, all of these other things. And some of them are, are sent signs, what we call determinatives. Uh -oh. So if I wanted to write the word house, right. pair in ancient Egyptian. So I do a P, which is this little rectangle, right. and then an R, which is a little, it looks like a little mouth. 
Right. And then I put a little house sign underneath it. Wait, so you just draw a house. house. If you want to draw a house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just do a house. It's a, the Egyptians believe the hieroglyphs were the, they call them medu nature. They call them the, the script of the gods. Oh. That when you actually write something down, it comes into being in the next life. Really? So this is sacred stuff. You put this on a temple wall, that will come into being in the next life. Was everybody very literate? Were they, were they poor no, people? No, no, it was no. just the priests and stuff were literate then, was it? 5% of society right. could really participate in all of this and, and were able to read and write, even able to afford coffins and, and all well, that. Yeah, so but it's, it's why a very are you so fascinated percentage. with death, by the way? What is your thing with death? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I am fascinated with death. But, but in a Who's very, this guy here as well? That's I, a lady. I, I, that's she, a lady? She lives in Frankfurt now. It's a lady. Really? Um, and, she doesn't um, look German to me, i got to be honest. <laughs> She's at a museum called the Liebig House, and she has three coffins there. And I spent many days with her, you know, looking at her. But actually, her mummy's not there. It's a weird thing. The Europeans would go into Egypt. They would find these lovely coffins, you know, triple set, you know, fits one inside another, inside another, like a set of Ru Russian oh, like Yassine the, dolls. Like the dolls. Right? Oh, that's so adorable. She has three, it's yeah. so cute, yeah. So she has three of those. But they took her mummy out, and nobody knows where the mummy is. <gasps> I know. Oh. <laughs> Do you ever get freaked out if, like, if you're working late at night and uh, and uh, you know, and there's like, you know, there's mummies and dead bodies around, and maybe you're wearing a little outfit and it's hot, and you take your glasses off and you let your hair down? Does that ever happen? No. Okay. No, but but in Cairo, when I, I worked on a lot of coffins for this book, and a lot of them were in Cairo, and there the bodies are still inside of the coffins. Oh. And they're smelly, and they're just really? kind of smelly. Yeah, it's strange. It's not like well, I've actually never smelled a fresh, rotting, dead body. Yeah. But. There's I imagine no business <laughs> like show business. I imagine it would smell bad. Yeah, but a, sure. a three thousand year old dead body. It smells musty and you know, yeah, if like, it's badly mummified, it doesn't smell very good. Right. Um, you wanna be cremated or you wanna be buried? Which do you want? I mean, I think probably uh there's a lot of choices. No, cremated. A lot of choices. Cremated. You go to your local funeral parlor and they're going to be like, we can do this. Well, this, I, they're not going to be asking me, want. are they? I mean, I... They could. You could decide this in advance, plan it out in advance. Well, right. well, you know, they're well, the commercials. Do you want your well, loved you're the one to make these see... choices for you or well, will you make it for them? Well, you, you could do it in you've advance. Got, you've seen all the options. What would you do? Ah, cremated. cremated. Or put me in one of those little cardboard boxes and just throw me in a hole. I don't really care. After seeing all the trouble people go through, it's not worth it. Really? It's kind of stupid. Yeah, and then you get somebody like you coming along a couple of thousand years later digging up. Oh, look, coffee. a fever! <laughs> yeah, no, that's it. It's lovely to see you again. Dr. Thank Cara Cooney, everybody. We'll be right back. I haven't seen you in an age. Where I have you know. been? I've been watching TV. I've been doing Facebook. I've been. Oh, wow. I've been watching my, oh, my Egyptian be... people take back yes, their no, government. Yes, no, no. It's, it's, what the heck is going Now, you've been out to Egypt a lot, haven't you? Uh, yeah, about every year for the past, I don't know, since 1994 when I, when I started this whole is, thing. Was, did anyone see this coming? Did you, were you aware I of this? I did not. I did not. I mean, we, we knew Tunisia was going to go, and we everybody who goes to Egypt and works there knows that the people are not happy with their government system, that the, the gap between rich and poor is getting wider every year. And you knew something was gonna happen, but you didn't know when, yeah, and this was the crazy, month. It was it? absolutely crazy. It's popping off. Yeah. And do, do you, have you got colleagues over there right now? Yes, a lot of colleagues, a lot of in friends. In the museums in, as well. In the museum, in Luxor, and different sites around the country. A now, lot of them have left, but a lot of them are still there. What's happening with that? Because I, I, I noticed that there was some people were attacking the museum or something? That yeah. seems odd to me. Now, the looting needs, before before I go into this, I should say that for every instance of looting, there are a thousand Egyptians ready to protect these monuments with oh, this clubs is their in national, their hands. This is a national it's treasure. National patrimony, but it's yeah. also the cultural heritage of the entire world. And if it hurts us to think of the mask of Tutankhamun being harmed, it, it's really a punch in the gut to the Egyptians. I mean, this right. is their, it, it's their emotional connection to their land. So right. there are people with the human chain around the museum. That is true. There, I, I've heard of stories about uh, possible looting at, at Luxor Temple, and they used the loudspeaker at the mosque to alert people. And people came out from everywhere with clubs to, to go against looters who had guns. So 
so for every instance of looting, and looting is opportunistic. There are opportunistic people everywhere in every society. Of, stuff? of I mean, course really? there is. Of course there you is. You can buy illegal mummies? Go online. Well, the mummies is a little different, and we can, we can talk about that. But there has been an antiquities market for generations. And right. if any of us can do anything, it's not buy antiquities. This is, this is something we should all do. I don't do. think don't many do people it. watching the show are going to be buying um, antiquities. I, <laughs> I, I, you know, that, that's more you your cable audience, I think. <laughs> You would be surprised, so just don't, especially now, don't, don't, don't even think you about buying me Bond villains. antiquities. <laughs> I always think it's Bond villains I go, yes, I'd quite like to own that Tutankhamun's pants. Well, well, and it makes you think, why would anyone go into the Cairo Museum and try to steal some of these objects that are so incredibly well known? Yeah, why? Well, there are many Egyptologists who suspect, and I, I, I'm not on the ground there, so I don't know, I can't right, tell okay. you the honest truth, but uh, who suspect that these are Mubarak's men who've been sent in to mess things up a little bit, to destroy things, to make it look like the mob outside is a mob that needs a firm hand, that needs a crackdown, that needs to be controlled. It's almost as if Mubarak were some kind of dictator. It almost is like that. <laughs> almost. Yeah. And so, and, but it backfired. I, I don't think, I mean, these guys rappelled down from the ceiling. They rappelled? One of the guys landed in a case, got hurt, and couldn't get out of the case, and then got carted off to jail. And, really? Yeah. I mean, well, that can't be. Serious. That's not rioting, then. There's no rappelling and rioting. The, that's, that's an organ. <laughs> Nice thing. Nobody says, quick, get the repelled. No. The repelled? Well, and they're trying to pass these guys off as ignorant thieves who don't know what they're looking at. I don't know ignorant thieves who can repel down from the roof of the Cairo Museum. I don't know that anyone who can repel. Little, yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> but, um, you know, the people are out there in the square. They're, they're trying to, to yeah. bring democracy to their country. So I think those two things need to be separated, and a lot of people are trying to put them together. Right. Okay. So uh, what, what, do, uh, what, do you, what do you do now, then? Are you, are you, are you going to go out there? You, you, I mean, because it's dangerous out there, Kyle. You've got a baby. You can't be going out there right now. I mean, no, I probably, maybe not this year, because with a baby, it's hard to go to Egypt Wait, with a baby. your baby now? Uh, he's, he's 10 months old. Oh, right. And um, he's just starting to walk, and he's just adorable and sweet. But I think it's a little hot, and, you know, food, and it's difficult. California I'd or, have to or Egypt? Egypt, Egypt, Egypt. Egypt, yeah. Egypt. So, no, I think I'll, I'll wait to take him to Egypt later, maybe in a couple of years. But I have friends who brought their, their little kids out to excavate know, out in the sand in the desert. And so... Do you want to put the curse? I mean, every time you open a tomb, there's a curse. I have one friend. We, we called her up, and she works for a group called Chicago House. And we all right. got together, and we're like, oh, how's Jen? How's Jen? Called her up and she was at work. She was just working, didn't you know, there's a revolution going on around you and yet the archaeologists, we keep our heads down and we just work. So, but you know. That's. It's nerdy. <laughs> it's nerdy. It's taking it too far though. I mean, cause yeah. it, it, you gotta be out there, you know, there's, uh, that stuff's been there for 5,000 years. It can wait a couple of weeks until this dies down. Well, but, and this is another point I do want to, I do want to make clear that these antiquities that are possibly being looted, these, these things that people are opportunistically trying to steal, nothing is as important as the people on the ground. Of course. And, you know, yeah, when yeah, you yeah. see all of this you know, yeah, the yeah, revolution yeah. stuff that's happening. And yet, we as archaeologists, we're freaking out. Absolutely freaking out, trying to figure out which objects in the Cairo Museum were hurt. And we can't get clear answers for all of this. And it's either 20 objects that have been damaged or it's 70 objects that have been damaged. Now, and we can't figure out what the, what the actual story is. Isn't there a tradition of this, though? I mean, the science in which you work in, Egyptology, yes. there is a tradition of looting and robbing and, 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 and damaging the graves because the graves are full of treasure. I mean, Egypt it, has the curse of an embarrassment of riches. And it's, its preservation is so pristine, so perfect. Those sands just cure everything and keep it all, the heads of mummies and all of that. Right. The, you have everything preserved. And so there are storage magazines. This is where they, they store the, the antiquities. Hundreds of them around the country at each different archaeological What's site. What's a storage magazine? Storage magazine is where the archaeologists find trinkets that aren't good enough for a museum and they put them in storage because no one's going to ever want to view them. I, so, that, that's the artifact I'd buy. So there's, you know, thousands of pieces of ceramic. There's little Shopti figurines. There's, sh there's bar parts of bodies. There's all kinds of things in these storage magazines. Parts of bodies? Well, they, it's, it's it's unusual to find them intact. So you'll have a skull and a torso and a hand and a foot, and you kind of put them in do you have storage magazines. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting. I was waiting. <laughs> Terribly sorry about that. It's, uh, oh, I didn't feel awful. No, shut up, Jeff. Well, you, you do find mummy genitalia, but that's a different. But they found that. that you do find mummy genitalia? You do find mummy genitalia, but oh, those. I heads, beg your pardon, Jeff. <laughs> I mean, it's, it preserves oh, everything. Yeah. It preserves everything. It's extraordinary. It really is. So, 
Egypt has, I mean, these are, there are hundreds of thousands of objects throughout the country that need to be protected. And that's why, okay, let me, let me put it this way. When Iraq fell and you saw the oh, looting of the, terrible and you saw the looting of the right? museum there yeah. and you saw a lot of people behaving very opportunistically. Right. I remember I said to my husband, that wouldn't happen in Egypt. The people would stand firm and they would protect that museum. And you know what? It happened. Uh, they uh, held uh, hands uh, in front of that museum. They stood there and they protected it. And that's happening all over the country at these storage magazines, these sites, mm -hmm. where, where you have things that would be easy pickings for a looter to take and then bring to it an antiquities market, some sort of dealer. And there, yeah, we should be so proud well, of people I, for protecting I hope it for the, all of uh, us. The, the, your archaeologist friends are safe, and I hope the people of Egypt find some kind of peace very yeah, soon. Too. It's lovely to see you again, Cara. Cara Cooney, everybody. We'll be right back. You look great, girl. Oh, thank you so much. It's you, great to be back. It's lovely to see you. You haven't been here in such a long time. Like three years? It seems like an era of Egyptian kings. And we talked about the revolution last time, so a lot's changed. What, what revolution? Egyptian revolution. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, gosh, yes. Uh, yeah. That was that was a thing. Yeah. yeah. But it's calm. Yeah, yeah. Have you been back since? Uh, no, no, but I'm going in March. Oh, you I'm are? going in March. Okay. Oh, yeah. Work in the Cairo Museum. It'll be good. Yeah, you'll be all right. You know what you're doing. Yeah, you know you know your way around there. You know the... And also, you're with the... You're pretty much with dead people most of the time anyway, aren't you? Yeah, but I'm bringing my son. I'm bringing my husband. I'm bringing the whole family. And we'll work in the car museum, coffins, and, and dead people the whole yeah, time. Well, yeah, and they're, they've been dead for a very long time. They're just yeah. dusty. They're like Jeff. <laughs> Some of my best friends live over there, yes. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I started the book. I'm about, I'd say... Page 20. 15? Huh? What? 15? No, 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 I'm a little further That's in than that. Good. It's, you're going to get flack for this mm -hmm. because uh, you're a scientist, you know, you're an academic. Okay, yeah, okay, so I teach at UCLA, I have graduate students, very serious work, I go to faculty meetings. Yeah. And my work in the Cairo Museum is, is very thorough, detailed, I make a contribution to the field, Yes, right? I know you do, I know. And this, I just wanted to have fun, I wanted to write something sexy and it's human se yeah, and emotional. Is. I know. And follow someone from cradle to grave and track her life and her decision making the whole way through. But so, a real person, of course, pronounce her name probably, Hatshepsut. 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 Yes. But the fact that we can't pronounce her name is what it's all about. Because I have to resurrect this poor woman, I have to, I have to bring her back from the dead because we've all forgotten about her. Well, well, um, uh, to be fair, the Egyptians forgot about her first. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, no, they, they, they had her chiseled out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the reliefs and the stones and how all of her statues smashed and all of that. Now, is but this... she's, I mean, she's, she's, she's a badass. Why did they have she's her... She's my badass. I mean, yeah, she, just, no, she's much her. more Cleopatra than Cleopatra is depicted, don't you think? No, I mean, I mean Cleopatra, how did she... She bought her way through sex to two Roman generals. Right. She breeded children to create a dynasty in the Eastern Mediterranean. This woman couldn't do any of that. She actually denied her sex, turned herself into a man. Like Elizabeth I nearly. In a way. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. I mean, she's doing everything right. She's matching herself to the system as much as she can. But because her success was so great, it was that much easier for the men after her to take credit. Does that make sense? The no, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I mean, well, but let's, let's be clear. I mean, it's not easy for women today to find political power, right? Okay. No, of course not. Right? Not okay, right. so female president, Congress, all of these. I mean, female president is possible, but yes, it's, it's yes. not something that's generally given. Do you think we're a bit behind the curve with that in America? It seems to me like right. we've had a lot of females running countries in other, uh, uh, other countries in the West, but America, not yet. I, it's humans. It's everybody. It's really? just the human race. It's the way we work. But that's part of why I wrote this, because I wanted to know why it's harder for women to, to gain those pinnacles of why power. Is it, why is it harder for women to gain oh. pinnacles of power? Okay, well, I talked about this backstage with a couple of people. And if I'm going to encapsulate it. Okay. Very, very, okay. So men have like a testosterone ambition. And females have an oxytocin ambition. So my ambition is to keep my family safe. 
It's to protect my, my child, my husband, whatever. You, you're going off out into the world and you're making connections and, and you're, you're, you're thinking broader. So then I bring it back to Hillary Clinton and what she once said, that a woman, if she has pictures of her family in her office, people look at that and they say, oh, is she doing her job? Does she care about, you know, is she just spending all of her time on her family or is she actually doing her job? And what's the name of the woman who was the CEO of Yahoo? Oh, when yeah, she had the baby yeah, yeah, and everyone yeah, yeah. freaked out because she had a baby. Yeah. And if a man had a wife with a baby, I mean, no one would have said a thing. He's got right. a baby at home. Okay, that's fine. But a man is, is able to, oh, and it goes with the microloan thing, right? So they Explain. Okay, so the microloans, they don't give them out to men. Because if a man gets a microloan, he takes his 50 bucks or 500 bucks and he goes to a bar and he builds social capital. He makes networks and he buys drinks for all the guys. Right. A woman gets her 50 bucks and she buys the cow and she makes cheese, and she makes the business, and she takes care of her family. Wait, where is this going? So, <laughs> in places where they give out microloans. Okay. But so, a woman is always going to be looking inward, and a man, not always, because there's gradients, but a woman will be looking inward, and a man will be looking outward, and so it's just harder for a woman to, to gain power. Now, all of these things are surmountable. All of these things can be transcended, but I think it's better to know about it. Is that not, not. Is, does it not exist in that way because traditionally men built the system? So therefore, if the system, you, you alter the system... You have a womb, you have breasts, you have to nurse. Do you I, have to I know where they are, that? but I mean, I'm just saying... <laughs> no, I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm not, I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm saying if you change the system, then surely it becomes easier, right? It, so, be, it becomes easier, but then somebody like Hillary Clinton steps up to, to take on power and people distrust her motives. Who is she taking care of? Is she taking care of the whole or is she taking care of just Well, that's the American own. political system. Let's remove it from America and have someone like Benazir Bhutto, perhaps, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, or Golda Meir, you know, yeah. uh, wildly different in their politics, but both very successful uh, leaders uh, in their, tragically, in the case of Benazir Bhutto, cut short. But, you know... And thank God we can transcend it and thank God it happens, but it is rare. It is rare. Well, yes, it is and rare. So, and so, for me, Hatshepsut is a resource. So she's somebody, she's a badass who did it and saw the obstacles in her path and managed to transcend them and do what she needed to do to get to that, to that place, to that pinnacle for a woman then, For a woman then to become successful in politics, uh, whether it be in ancient Egypt or uh, the modern United States, must she then deny uh, some form of femininity? Must she claim some kind of testosterone type ambition for herself? I don't know. I mean, Hatshepsut had to, but for her it was very specific because she was ruling with a co-king and she was ruling with a young man who was getting older. And when he became a man, mm -hmm. she's the senior king. You're gonna have a woman tell a man what to do. That's untenable. That's not something that people Happens do. in my house all the time. Yeah. In your house, yeah. in your house, but not in public, not in front of other people. Oh, so for okay. her as a yeah. woman to tell, yeah. okay, maybe. Yeah. But, and I like to run things the same, but right. that's just, that's us. Awesome. But, but for her to then tell this co-king, this junior king, as a woman, right. what to do and to hold the senior position was problematic. So that's when she started to depict herself as a man. Do you, well, I mean, I, I'm trying to think, you know, putting it into a modern context for myself. I grew up in the era of Margaret Thatcher in, in Britain, yeah. who was extremely unpopular uh, for her politics. But I don't say, you know, with certain people, and of course, extremely popular with other people for her politics. But I, the, I'm not the, a fan. So. Uh, well, you know, the thing is, the whether you are or you're not, and I don't know anything <laughs> about the politics of Hatshepsut, but um, whether or not you're a fan, it didn't seem to be... Yeah, I certainly, I can't remember it being because she was a woman. It was because of her politics that she was a polarizing figure. Uh, even Sarah Palin, I don't think, who was a very polarizing figure during the, the McCain campaign, I don't think it was because she was a woman. I think it was because some people uh, were uh, very aggressively for her and some were very aggressively against her. But I don't think it was uh, femininity. Yeah, but, but how many people talk about what Sarah Palin's wearing, what Margaret Thatcher was wearing? That is true. That is absolutely true. Yes. The amount of, of press swirling around Sarah Palin and her outfits and her shopping and what she was doing yes. with children or not, those are not the kinds of things that would Attract, uh, well, I think that's true. But I, th I think that that's. I think women are as guilty as that uh, uh, as men, though. Or don't you think? Well, I mean, I'm wearing my black dress, so here it's I. It's very nice. <laughs> it's very nice. Oh gosh, it's nice to talk to you again. I haven't talked to you in such a long time. A while. This is like a breath of fresh air. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're out of time. Uh,
<laughs> but this is very good and very interesting. But and and the fact that you're. It's not fictional, but it's imagined, right? I'm trying to, to tell it with as much life as I can. So there is there is conjecture in here. Right. It's not meant to be dry. It's not meant to be academic. Um, it, it, it counts for nothing at my university. I mean, this is meant to be fun for me to really tell a story as... Yeah, I mean, but I'm you write a book, it goes in, this is in the Smithsonian with all your other work. It, it goes oh, there. Okay. This is part of the body of work. So in years to come, when they're looking at, you know, well, yeah, Dr. Yeah, yeah, Cooney's no. research into, you know, Egyptian burial rituals, oh, wait, what's this? <gasps> a pot boiler with a picture of a map? Come on! <laughs> you know. yeah. Um, but no, if I can resurrect her, use her as a resource, dig up somebody from 3,500 years ago, I mean, that's a privilege. It's, it's, it's great. You're very good at it. You're a very, very clever woman. You, know, you never cease to impress me and engage me. I'm delighted to see you again. Dr. Karakuni, everybody. <laughs>